Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with all of you at CFB Trenton, alongside my colleagues, the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland, Minister Blair, and of course, General Eyre and Chief Xavier, RCAF Commander Lieutenant General Kenny, and Eight Wing Commander Colonel James. La semaine dernière, vous avez entendu mes collègues vous parler de nouvelles mesures qui soutiendront les Canadiens et Canadiennes dans l'ensemble du pays. Une fois de plus, aujourd'hui, nous répondons aux besoins du présent. Notre gouvernement investit dans l'avenir et la sécurité de notre pays. As we invest in the future, we will be there to support the members of the Canadian Armed Forces. I'd like to first of all thank the members of, CA, of, the, of the CAF here today for their service and commitment to Canada. Today's announcement is as much about you as it is about ensuring that we have the tools that you need to succeed. And now it is my pleasure to welcome the Prime Minister to the podium. Mr. Premier Ministre, vous la parole. Merci Ginette pour l'introduction et pour tout ton travail en tant que ministre des anciens combattants. Je suis très heureux d'être ici ce matin en compagnie de la vice-première ministre Christian Freeland et du ministre de la Défense Bill Blair aussi. I want to thank General Wayne Eyre and the members of Eight Wing and other CAF members at CFB Trenton for having us here today with them. This Canadian Forces base where we are today, CFB Trenton, was established in a time of peace between the First and Second World Wars. Its farmland became an airbase for the Royal Canadian Air Force. It opened nearly a century ago, and during the Second World War it became the largest training centre and unit of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. My grandfather, James Sinclair, would have come through Trenton when he was a member of the RCAF on his way to serve in North Africa during the Second World War. People came here from far and wide to train and fly, people who went off to war, people who fought to defend what Canada stands for, freedom, justice, fairness, and peace. A lot of people who didn't come home. They were a generation that made immense sacrifices so we, their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren could live in peace. Service to country and to Canadian values defines who we are. We've always known that we're the best country in the world, so we understand our obligation to do our part. It's what we did in World War I and World War II, where names like Vimy Ridge, Dieppe, and Juno Beach became part of Canadian lore. It's what we did in the decades that followed. It's why Cap Young Hill in Korea, Camp Nathan Smith in Kandahar, and Camp Adatsi in Latvia are so meaningful. Grâce au courage des Canadiens sur les champs de bataille au cours de notre histoire, le Canada a pu augmenter son influence sur la scène internationale. Je pense à la fondation de l'OTAN, à la crise du canal de Suez, au processus de paix en Irlande du Nord auquel on a contribué, et à la présence de Romeo Dallaire sur le terrain au Rwanda il a 30 ans cette fin de semaine. Canadians are connected to the world. We've always punched above our weight. Today, we live in an increasingly complex and challenging time. So now, more than ever, the world needs more Canada, and the world needs more Canadians. And whereas in the entirety of the 20th century, we sent our people out to the front lines across the world, we are now on the front lines of new and evolving threats. Technological advances and cyber attacks mean there are myriad ways for engagement that go beyond traditional borders. Rising and disruptive powers like China and Russia mean NATO's northern and western flank is the Canadian Arctic. And climate change is rapidly reshaping Canada and reshaping our north. Les membres des Forces armées canadiennes sont déployés plus souvent qu'avant pendant les feux de forêt et des ouragans. La glace polaire est en train de fondre et, les voies <coughs> et nos voies navigables sont plus accessibles qu'à tout autre moment de notre histoire. The Northwest Passage 
could become the most efficient shipping route between Europe and Asia by 2050. That's just 26 years away. Canadians are, once again, called upon to meet the moment. Today, we are announcing our next commitment to our armed forces and to Canadians' security with the investments laid out in our North strong and free. It makes $73 billion worth of investments over the next 20 years. Our North strong and free invests in new surveillance capabilities for land, sea, and air in the North. It leverages Canada's world-class technology, including in AI and quantum, so we can stay ahead of the curve. It creates jobs, and importantly, it supports all those of you who serve. This is about protecting our values, our sovereignty, and our North. Indigenous peoples have long been integral to Canada's identity as a Northern nation, but too often defense in the North has been entirely separate from the people who've lived there for millennia. This must never again be the case. Our investments in the North must serve both Canada's defense and the well-being and success of the Inuit, First Nations, and Métis, who've always been its stewards. This is something I've heard directly from Inuit leadership and a crucial piece of our work together to advance the Arctic and Northern policy framework. Aujourd'hui, on vous présente notre plan de 73 milliards de dollars sur 20 ans pour renouveler la vision du Canada en matière de défense qu'on a appelée notre Nord fort et libre. L'importance stratégique de l'Arctique canadien est en train d'augmenter à cause des changements climatiques, alors on va le protéger. On va rester à la fine pointe de la technologie et on va s'assurer que notre défense soit moderne et qu'elle corresponde à nos objectifs. On va investir dans de nouvelles capacités, dans du nouveau matériel et dans les membres des forces armées canadiennes. Les investissements qu'on fait aujourd'hui s'ajoute à d'autres investissements substantiels qu'on a déjà fait. Souvenons-nous qu'en 2014, les dépenses en, manière, en matière de défense avaient chuté à juste 1 % de notre produit intérieur brut. Depuis 2016, notre gouvernement met le Canada sur la bonne voie pour que ses, défenses en ses dépenses en matière de défense aient plus que doublé avant 2026. Ces investissements nous ont permis d'augmenter nos contributions à l'OTAN, de moderniser et de renforcer le NORAD et d'accroître notre présence dans la région Indo-Pacifique. And we are supporting our friends in Ukraine as they push back against Putin. Russia's illegal and unjustifiable in invasion is a direct attempt to fracture the foundations of democracy and our global rules-based order. It's an attempt to undermine the values and principles that previous generations fought for, subsequent generations benefited from, and that we must secure for this generation of Canadians and the next. This is why we are stepping up once again, to preserve and defend the rules-based order that has allowed people around the world to prosper for the better part of the last century, to stand up for Canadian values like freedom, justice, fairness, and peace, to keep Canada and the world safer in a time of increasing difficulty, now is the time to do even more. And our government is answering the call with this investment. Avant de terminer, j'aimerais m'adresser directement aux femmes et aux hommes des Forces armées canadiennes. Le monde change, mais nos valeurs en tant que Canadiens ne changent pas. Every day, you, as proud members of the Canadian Armed Forces, show us what service to country, service to the values, ideals, and people of this country means. We need you. The world needs you to continue to step up. And we will be there to give you the support, resources, and tools you need to match your courage and your convictions. Merci pour tout ce que vous faites. We will now turn it over to the Deputy Prime Minister. Christian. Good morning. Today, 
it's worth reminding ourselves why Canada steps up, why we devote time and treasure to foreign policy and defence, why we send Canadian soldiers, sailors, aviators, diplomats, aid workers, intelligence officers, doctors, nurses, medics and engineers into dangerous places even when Canadian soil is not directly at risk. Force is, of course, always a last resort. But the principled use of force, together with our allies and governed by international law, is part of our history, and it must be part of our future. To have that capacity requires a substantial investment, which our government is making. A maître prise les forces armées canadiennes, que ce soit en Lettonie ou en Nouvelle-Écosse, ont répondu à l'appel des Canadiennes et Canadiens. Et maintenant, c'est à notre tour de faire notre part pour nos forces armées. When I was in Poland with the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defence in February, I had the opportunity to meet members of the Canadian Armed Forces who are training members of the Armed Forces of Ukraine as part of Operation Unifier. They were amazing. I was so moved and inspired by their dedication and their commitment to service, to serving others and to serving Canada. Every day they are helping democracy triumph over dictatorship. They are proud of their work, as we all should be. So I want to take a moment to say to them and to all members of our Canadian Armed Forces, including the great people who are with us here today, Thank you. Merci beaucoup. We are here for you, just as you are here for us every single day. As a country, we are so proud of you, and we are tremendously grateful for your service. À une époque où les besoins en matière de défense et de sécurité changent plus rapidement que jamais, Les membres de nos forces armées doivent avoir les outils et les ressources nécessaires pour assurer la sécurité du Canada et sa population. Canada's national interest in investing in a capable, professional, and robust military is clear. If middle powers are not prepared to stand up for and, if necessary, fight for peace and stability around the world, the rules of the game, including international borders, will be left for the great powers to determine between themselves. That would not be good for the world. And that most certainly would not be good for Canada and Canadians. We cannot be at the mercy of decisions made without us in foreign capitals. We must be a strong and reliable partner for our democratic allies. That is why we are making these necessary investments in our military, to place the Canadian Armed Forces on a stronger footing with the equipment, training, and resources they need, with the equipment, training, and resources you need, and with the consistent, predictable funding needed to do difficult, dangerous, and absolutely essential work. Investing in our armed forces is an investment in Canada's sovereignty, in our future prosperity. It is an investment in Canadians. We are investing to protect democracy, freedom, peace, 
and fairness for the next generation of Canadians so they can enjoy the same security and prosperity that was bequeathed to us by our parents and grandparents, often at a very, very high price. We owe young Canadians no less. Thank you. And over now to our Minister of Defence. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. One of the greatest responsibilities of every national government is to ensure the security of their citizens and for us, the responsibility to ensure the safety, security and defense of Canada for all Canadians is our primary role. In order to fulfill that role, we need people in uniform. We need partners and we need allies and we need to invest significantly in our country's defense. And over the past few years, we have steadily increased our defense spending through our 2017 defense policy, Strong, Secure and Engaged, and our plan to modernize NATO, NORAD. But, quite frankly, and as has been well articulated by the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, the world has changed and continues to change, and we must do more. The changing threat environment is one of the things that challenges us most significantly. Climate change is disproportionately affecting our Arctic, which is warming at four times the global average. And as the polar ice cap melts, the Arctic is becoming more accessible and we are seeing much greater Russian and Chinese activity in the region. Overseas, Russia is undermining the international rules that has kept us all safe for nearly 80 years through its illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. And China is challenging these same rules in the Indo-Pacific. And at the same time, technology is rapidly changing with new missiles and other threats that are moving faster and are harder to detect. And to meet this moment, we need to step up. We need to invest more in our national defense. And today, we are releasing our North Strong and Free, a renewed vision for Canada's defense. With the new investments that we're announcing today, Canada will invest an additional $8.1 billion over the next five years and approximately $73 billion over the next 20 years. The investments, which will be in Budget 2024, will bring our defense spending to 1.76% of GDP by 2029-2030. This is a very significant and necessary step towards reaching our NATO commitment of 2% of GDP. And by 2030, our government will have almost tripled our defense budget from 2014-2015. Through this policy, we are committing to an ambitious program of investment that will leave Canadians safer and more prosperous. Job number one is ensuring Canada's sovereignty here at home specifically in our Arctic and in our northern regions. And to get this done, we are making a series of focused investments in the Arctic and for continental security. These will include a new fleet of early warning aircraft, a new fleet of tactical helicopters, a network of infrastructure in the north, long-range missiles to deter threats to Canada, new maritime sensors and a satellite ground station in the Arctic, and much more. There will be significant opportunities to invest in multi-use infrastructure that can support CAF operations and at the same time contribute to the needs of territorial governments, Indigenous people and Northern communities. We will work with First Nations, Métis and Inuit in truth partnership and consultation. And I have the opportunity over the past few days to speak to all of our Northern Premiers, the, the, the leadership of the ITK and the AFN, and we are absolutely committed to working collaboratively together to produce the best results for our Northern communities for Canada's defense. We are also exploring options to renew and expand our submarines with a new conventional fleet which will be capable of operating under the ice. We're exploring options to protect our critical infrastructure with ground-based air defenses. And on top of this, we're also establishing a new cyber, a CAF Cyber Command to better integrate the CAF and communication security establishment into a unifying team to support Canadian interests. And I would point out that we have both the Chief of Defense and the Chief of, of CSE here with us today. And as we prioritize the defense of Canada, we are also investing in the capabilities that we need to be a reliable NATO ally and to maintain a persistent presence in the Indo-Pacific. This will include investments to extend the life of our Halifax-class class, Halifax frigates as we deliver on the new combat sur surface combatants. In, we are investing $9.4 billion to build more artillery and ammunition in Canada, including a significant $300 million investment 
to help Canadian industry tool up to create new production lines and to secure new supply chains. We are exploring options to, with our industry to modernize our artillery weapons and to upgrade and replace our tank and lab fleets. Defence policy is also industrial policy, and today's announcement is intended to give our industry partners the certainty and clarity that they have been very clear that they require to increase production and to support our troops. Ramping up our production is vital because, in fact, production is deterrence, and it supports thousands of good jobs right across this country. To our industry partners, we know that we need to do business differently, and that is why we are launching a review of our defence procurement processes to get more equipment delivered faster and more efficiently for all Canadians. And as we proceed with this work, we, knew, we know that the world will continue to rapidly evolve. And to properly account for these changes, we're also committed to a regular cycle of defence policy reviews and national security strategies every four years. And of course, none of this work is possible without the extraordinary people who work in the Department of National Defence and the Canadian Armed Forces which is why we are going to invest $100 million to improve child care access for CAP members and an additional $300 million to improve military housing. We will also be taking measures to recruit and retain more members for the Canadian Armed Forces, including by reforming some of our medical and security processes. And I want to provide all of you with the assurances we will not compromise on the extraordinary and excellent standards that you have always maintained. We just need to get more people in the door. And to get more people into uniforms faster, will be creating a number of innovations, including the introduction of a probationary period. We need to attract and retain people from right across Canada and for them to feel that they can make an extraordinary contribution and have an extraordinary career as members in, of the Canadian military. Ultimately, this policy is about building a Canadian Armed Forces ready to meet tomorrow's challenges. A, a military that's equipped to defend the Arctic and to protect Canada's sovereignty from the new threats we are facing and to fulfill our obligations and to do our part to maintain Canada's place in keeping global peace. This policy, our North Strong and Free, will give our troops the tools that they need to defend Canada, to preserve our values for which generations of Canadians have fought before us. It will help Canada to defend the freedom and prosperity that our parents have bequeathed to us. And it will ensure that the next generation of Canadians and the Canadian Armed Forces members can count on a modern, reliable tools to keep our country safe in a changing world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. We'll now begin the question period. One question, one follow-up. First question goes to Christian Noel from Rackham. Bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Les règles pour le recrutement vont être changées au niveau médical, au niveau de la sécurité. Comment vous allez vous assurer que ça ne va pas diluer la force des membres? On comprend que la technologie est en train de transformer la façon que qu'on travaille dans toutes les différentes industries et ça s'applique aussi aux, euh, aux forces armées canadiennes. On a des opportunités d'amener euh, plus de gens dans les forces armées, mais comme euh, le ministre l'a dit, on ne va pas compromettre sur la sécurité, les implications pour euh, le bien-être de tous ceux qui servent dans les forces armées, mais nous reconnaissons qu'il euh, y a des gens qui euh, veulent servir et peuvent contribuer au sein des forces armées canadiennes euh, avec les nouvelles technologies qu'on euh, qu connaît maintenant. Okay. I think one of the things we know is that technology and uh, various innovations is transforming the world of work in just about every industry, and Canadian Armed Forces is no exception to those transformations. Uh, we know that uh, with increased use of technology, there's a wider range of people who can serve their country through the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, that is what is being looked at in a very responsible way by both the Minister of Defence and the Chief of Defence Staff and others, um, with the guarantee, as uh, Bill just pointed out, that in no way will we ever compromise the safety of anyone serving in the Canadian Armed Forces. With these new investments, even since 2030, on sera à 1,76% du produit intérieur brut. Vous voyez venir, les gens de l'OTAN aimeraient bien qu'on soit à 2%. Vous en avez fait la promesse à Vilnius. Comment vous expliquez ça aux Canadiens? Tout d'abord, il faut se souvenir d'où on vient. Quand on a pris le pouvoir en 2015, le Canada dépensait autour de 1% de son produit intérieur brut en défense sous les conservateurs en 2014. Donc, à partir de ce moment-là, on a commencé à investir beaucoup plus dans les forces armées. Effectivement, entre 2016 et maintenant 2026, on avait 
projeté une augmentation de 70 Maintenant, on va doubler. C'est une augmentation de 100 des investissements qu'on est en train de faire dans nos forces armées canadiennes. Et on va continuer d'accroître nos investissements de façon responsable, de façon raisonnable. Je comprends qu'on continue de travailler pour atteindre ce 2 et on va continuer de le faire avec d'autres dépenses qu'on annonce aujourd'hui, mais euh, où on n'a pas mis les investissements en place parce que, par exemple, pour les sous-marins, pour euh, augmenter euh, les, le nombre de personnel au sein des Forces armées canadiennes, euh, on va continuer euh, de regarder les besoins et comment on va le faire de façon responsable. Mais nous allons continuer de nous assurer que les Canadiens et les Forces armées canadiennes ont l'équipement et les ressources nécessaires pour protéger le Canada et pour faire notre part au sein de, des organisations internationales comme NORAD, comme l'OTAN, euh, comme d'autres engagements à travers le monde. Next question. Mr. Prime Minister, with uh, this renewed commitment uh, to defense spending, it goes to 1.76% GDP, which still falls short of the 2% NATO target. How did you, how did your government determine that we could not get to that 2% by 2029-2030? I think it's important to remember where we started on this. When we took office in 2015, we had uh, Canadian Armed Forces that had been significantly underinvested in by the previous government. The Conservatives actually had us down to 1% of GDP in 2014 and had had, had for a few years. Um, we started to invest massively in the Canadian Armed Forces, our first uh, defense policy update, secure uh, 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 SSE, uh, was uh, an increase of 70% uh, in our defense spending uh, that we have now, with uh, this, our North Strong and Free, uh, announced is boosting up to 100% investments increase, so doubling our investments in defense from 2016 to 2026. We know this is important for the world we're in right now, and it's important to tool up the women and men of the Canadian Forces with the equipment and the resources and support necessary. But we also know there is more to do. For example, we talk about uh, exploring and defining the submarine capabilities we're going to need to patrol and protect our Arctic in the coming decades. Uh, that is investments that Canada is going to be making in our Canadian Armed Forces, but we haven't yet defined exactly what types of submarines and how they're going to be deployed, so we haven't put in the money that Canada will be spending on submarines in the coming years uh, into this calculation. We are investing in institutional strength for our Canadian Armed Forces, but we also know, for example, that getting our recruitment numbers up is going to be important. We're not quite at where our targets are right now, but in the coming years we will want to increase the size of the Canadian Armed Forces to meet the challenges of uh, the world we're meeting, and that is going to require more investments. So even as we project getting up to 1.76% of GDP in the coming years, we know there is more to come over the coming years as Canada continues to step up in a more uncertain and, quite frankly, more dangerous world. In this new policy statement, this document, there's a lot of talk about building up uh, our North American defenses, our commitments to NORAD, Arctic sovereignty, but there is very little discussion of what we're going to do in regards to peacekeeping. What does this mean for the future of Canada when it comes to peacekeeping? That the world has changed in some very significant ways over the past years. Uh, we've seen, uh, whether it's the rise of authoritarian states, uh, the uh, pushback by Russia, China, and others on the rules-based order that has kept us safe and stable and prosperous as, uh, as a world for the past 70 years uh, that requires us uh, to be uh, more active in new and different ways. Canada will continue to be there to step up around the world, including as part of UN missions where necessary. But whether it's a UN mission or a NATO mission or uh, a NORAD engagement, the capabilities must be there. And that's why our investments in uh, some really important institutional capabilities for the Canadian Armed Forces uh, will apply across the broad range of missions that we uh, ask our Canadian Armed Forces to engage in. Next question. 
Hi, Prime Minister Tom Barrett, the CBC. Um, procurement seems like this constant problem for the Canadian forces, and I know that seven years ago you made a number of commitments in your previous uh, defence uh, policy. Some of them have come through, some of them haven't. So what can you point to in this policy review that says, okay, we're going to speed up procurement for the Canadian forces? Procurement has always uh, been a challenge because there are two sometimes competing pressures on, on procurement. We obviously want to get the best possible equipment uh, for our Canadian Armed Forces at the best possible price to taxpayers, but we also often want to build up our own uh, production capacities in Canada to make sure there are good jobs for Canadians as uh, we develop uh, tools and equipment needed uh, by the Canadian Armed Forces. Getting that balance right of encouraging industrial benefits for Canada while making sure we're getting the largest amount of the right equipment for our Canadian Armed Forces uh, is a tension that we're going to continue to work through. But the commitment in this, uh, in this uh, uh, update is very much focused on uh, learning uh, from some of the very real challenges that our Canadian Armed Forces and the Department of Defence have faced over the past decades around procurement to accelerate it, to speed it up, uh, and uh, to make it more transparent and reliable for uh, our forces. Uh, this is a significant commitment where, as you say, we have uh, made advances on and where we need to do more. And on, on recruitment, um, what's wrong? with the recruiting system? I mean, I guess that's a big question, but are we not getting the right applicants? Are people just not interested in joining? Is the system just not working? And could you also just expand on that point you made about uh, technology allowing more Canadians to serve in the military? I'll actually turn to uh, the Minister of Defence for, uh, for uh, more specifications on that. Uh, but in terms of recruitment, we saw, particularly after the pandemic, uh, a dip, but it's a dip uh, in recruitment numbers that has happened around the world. Uh, most of our allies are facing the same challenges. In a recent conversation with uh, the Chief of Defence Staff, uh, Wayne pointed out that uh, the numbers are getting better and that is good news And we're because we've been working very, very hard on uh, creating more recruitment opportunities, demonstrating that uh, the Canadian Armed Forces is uh, an effective and powerful way of serving one's country and building a life for themselves. That's where $100 million and more childcare spaces for uh, CAF members, uh, almost $300 million for better housing uh, for CAF members is going to be uh, part of helping with the recruitment, but also is this commitment we are making right now as Canada to invest $73 billion dollars more over the coming 20 years in the kinds of support, resources, and tools that our Canadian Armed Forces need. But I'm happy to turn to uh, uh, Minister Blair for a few more uh, uh, comments on this. If I may, just very briefly, with respect to recruitment, we've seen over the, over the past number of years actually more people have left than have actually joined the, the Canadian Armed Forces. And we've done a pretty deep dive into why that's happening. I very sincerely believe that there are Canadians and permanent residents right across this country who want an opportunity to serve their country, to serve in the Canadian Armed Forces, and we've got to make sure that we modify our processes to ensure that they give an op are given that opportunity quickly. And if someone has to wait 18 months, they've moved on to other opportunities. So we've got to go faster, and at the same time, we've seen some of our processes that, because it is, it is, it's mostly a paper-based system, it's not digitized, we be believe that the application of, of, of technology is going to help us speed up those processes. I can assure you of the absolute unwavering commitment of the Canadian Armed Forces. They understand people are our greatest asset, and we need to get the right people with the right skill sets into the Canadian Armed Forces. And at the same time, we're working really hard, as the Prime Minister has already mentioned, to create a supportive work environment for every member of the service so that, that, that they can access affordable housing, that, that for a family they can, they can get access to medical services and, and child care. Um, we have work to do, and we are absolutely committed to doing that work. We now have the resources to apply in that work, but everywhere I've traveled across the country, people have talked about some of the challenges they face in service. Our job is to, to help manage those challenges so that when people make the choice to serve their country, um, that, 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 that choice is, is well supported by the Canadian Armed Forces and by the Government of Canada. Thank you, Minister. Next question. Uh, Tara Deschamps, the Canadian Press. Uh, the AUKUS security pact is reportedly preparing to expand its second phase. Is Canada seeking to join the alliance in Pillar 2? Uh, yes, 
Uh, we are already observers in one of the working groups in Pillar 2 of AUKUS, and uh, we have had excellent conversations with both uh, the U.S., the U.K., and uh, Australia as uh, how we can work even closer. And quite frankly, it's good news. Uh, that uh, both Canada and uh, New Zealand are going to be joined by Japan that is engaging uh, more closely in AUKUS conversations as well around phase two. I think it's really important that allies, particularly across the Indo-Pacific, uh, work together in stronger and tighter ways and uh, those Canadian conversations uh, with our partners will continue. Given your focus on Arctic sovereignty and the need for under ice capability, I'm wondering wouldn't nuclear capable submarines make more sense at this stage and will that be part of a, a longer term plan? That is certainly uh, what uh, we will be looking at as to what type of submarines are most appropriate for uh, Canada's responsibility in protecting uh, the longest coastline in the world and certainly the longest Arctic coastline in the world. Uh, we recognize that with climate change, the opening of the Northwest Passage to uh, ship traffic is going to require a lot more capabilities by Canada to demonstrate and uh, responsibly patrol its own uh, internal waters. Uh, and that's where we have uh, framed out in this uh, policy update uh, a need to lean in carefully to determine what kinds of submarines we're going to need for the coming years and uh, how best to procure them. Thank you. Last question. Hi, Prime Minister. Mercedes Stevenson with Global News. This was a defense policy review that was years in the making, and it makes no secret of how urgent the changes that are required are in terms of uh, especially attempts by our adversaries in the Arctic. Despite that, most of the spending is significantly backloaded, not only beyond the next election, but the election after that. If this is so urgent and knowing how long it takes to procure things for the Canadian Armed Forces, why isn't your government investing more upfront faster? Eight billion dollars over the next five years is a significant investment in our armed forces right now. Uh, but recognizing the need and the reality of constantly changing systems uh, and challenges in the world, uh, which is why we've put in a four year cycle on uh, the next uh, de uh, defense policy updates to align with our national security updates. Uh, these are important pieces of making sure that we are uh, meeting the moment we're in right now. Uh, there are a lot of concrete investments that are going to be flowing right now as uh, investments that we've made over the past, whether it was the $38 billion modernization of NORAD, whether it was the $19 billion to buy 88 F-35s. These are investments that we've been making to deliver as quickly as possible for the women Canadian Armed Forces and our uh, requirements to be there for our allies. A lot can change in five years for your government. It was buying the F-35. If you're trying to project future threats, one of the things I noticed in the document, and then there was no follow-up on, so I'm hoping to find out what it's about, was the Canadian Armed Forces helping domestic law enforcement in Canada. What does that involve? Happy to turn to uh, Minister Blair for that. Yeah. Yeah. He's an expert in both. He's <laughs> done a bit of both. First of all, the National Defence Act, one of the responsibilities of the Canadian Armed Forces, in addition to all of the, the, the extraordinary work and challenges that we place before them, is to be there when required to assist what we call civil authority. And so that legislation, we need to have that capacity. We also, I, I think it's important to acknowledge, we've called upon the Canadian Armed Forces many times over the past three years to help Canadians respond to, to wildfires, for floods, for hurricanes. When Canadians needed someone to come to their rescue, we turn to the Canadian Armed Forces and I have to ensure that they have the capability to continue to be there for Canadians and at the same time we also have to acknowledge that when we call upon them to do that it can take them away from other training opportunities or other deployments and so growing the Canadian Armed Forces making sure they have that training and capability to always still be there for Canadians is an important responsibility. Thank you that concludes today's press conference. Thank you. Thank you for your